Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Seth Monahan, professor of music theory, and I'm here with another video in my series on the basics of classical harmony and counterpoint. Today we're going to take a break from chord syntax to focus on listening. More specifically, I want to explore a kind of three-dimensional hearing that lets us distinguish between different layers of musical activity. I call the lesson Listening Below the Surface. Now, if you're wondering what that means, bear with me for a second while we do a little experiment. Here is a short passage from Mozart's Ninth Piano Concerto. I'm going to play it for you twice, and I want you to ask yourself two questions. First, how many chord changes do you hear? And then second, why would that even be an interesting question for me to ask? So here it is for the first time. And here it is again. So how many chord changes did you hear? The reason I think this is an interesting question is that I typically get two very different answers from students. Indeed, sometimes I get these two answers from the same student. So on the face of it, it's a pretty easy question. If you can count, you can find 25 chords here. In the first system, Mozart goes back and forth between root position 5 and root position 1 four times, and then he uses 5-6 and 5-4-3 in the last bar. Then in the second system, he goes back and forth between 5-6 and 1 over and over again with a slight change in the last bar. We get 5-4-3 and 1-6, and then there's finally a tonic in the last bar. So it's not inaccurate to say that there are 25 chords here, because there are. But when I ask students to sort of squint their ears and tell me how many chord changes they really feel here, I often get a different answer. Three. Another way of getting at this is to ask them where they feel the most important harmonic moments are. And again, they'll almost always say three. So let's listen again and see if you can find those three crucial moments. So if you're like many of my students, you've zeroed in on three important harmonic moments. The first downbeat with its tonic emphasis, the fifth downbeat with its dominant emphasis, and then the last downbeat, which is tonic emphasis again. And the reason that students so consistently flag these moments has everything to do with rhythm. Notice, first of all, that in the opening four bars, every single strong beat features a tonic chord. All the dominants are on weak beats. Then that changes. In the next four bars, it's the dominants that land on the strong beats and the tonics that get pushed over onto the weak beats. And then only at the very end, at the third important harmonic moment, we find tonic lands again on a strong beat. So if our gut tells us that something important happened at the beginning of the second system, it's because suddenly the dominant chord gets the rhythmic emphasis. That's what changes. And the lesson here is that thanks to rhythm, not all chords are created equally. Rhythm creates a hierarchy, which lets us hear the tonic as the most important chord for four bars, then dominant as more important for four bars, and then finally tonic at the end. Listen again and see if you can hear it. Now we're ready to understand what listening below the surface means. Music theorists love depth metaphors because they help us describe this kind of multidimensional experience of harmony and counterpoint. My fellow theorists would say that on the, quote, surface of the music here, we've got 25 chords. No one's debating that. But, quote, unquote, underneath, there are really only three harmonies. Four bars of tonic, four bars of dominant, and then back to tonic. Another metaphor that theorists like is that of structure. Theorists like to say, for instance, that in the first four bars, the tonic is the structural chord, and the dominants are just decorative. They're embellishments. Let's listen one more time. See if you can get these metaphors to work for you. So let's recap. Rhythm and meter, we learned, can create hierarchy, which is to say the sense that certain notes or chords sound more important than others. And theorists often describe this distinction in terms of surface versus depth or structure versus embellishment. And as a result of this hierarchy, we can sometimes hear different levels of harmonic motion, quick chord changes at the surface and slower motions underneath. 
It also lets us hear different levels of melodic activity. Let's go back to the Mozart, and this time we'll listen for melody and counterpoint instead of chord changes. Here's the score again, with those colored blocks in place to remind us where the tonic and dominant areas were. Now the first thing we need to do is figure out where the actual melody is, because the pianist's right hand is really busy, and it combines melody and harmony. The real melody, I think, lies in the pitches above each bass note, so we can simplify things to get at the basic counterpoint here. If I play this, you can hear that the essence of the passage is still intact. But what does it mean to listen below the surface here? I think it means asking if there's a basic melodic skeleton holding the whole thing together, ideally one that corresponds with the quote-unquote deeper chord changes here. And actually, it's pretty easy. Here are all the scale degrees of the outer voice counterpoint. It's a lot of notes. But here's what happens if we tease out only the ones that line up with the structural chords. All of a sudden, it's crystal clear. Melodically, the backbone of the passage is a rising stepwise line. And this happens while the bass dips down to seven and comes back again. Another way of thinking about this is to ask ourselves, where does that first melodic note go? At the quote-unquote surface, it rises by step to F. Right there. And underneath, structurally, it also rises by step to F, but not that F, this F, which in turn rises by step to G four bars later. So I'm going to play it one more time at the risk of making you really tired of it. And as we do, try to listen for these long-range melodic connections. This. Indeed, you might want to ask yourself whether this analysis might just be teasing out something you kind of already had noticed, but maybe hadn't quite put your finger on yet. So, before we look at another example, I want to make a few quick points. First, these deeper musical structures aren't really in the music. Their existence can't be proved or disproved. They are products of interpretation, which means they're only as real as our experience of them. Though, of course, we can try to share our experiences with others by inviting them to hear things as we do. That's what I've been doing for the past five minutes. The second point is that we shouldn't expect to find these kinds of deeper structures everywhere all the time. I certainly don't. But I'm always keeping my ears open for these sort of long-range connections and processes. And they turn up more often than you think. I think it's certainly a good habit to have. And third, I want to stress that talking about depth and surface does not involve a value judgment. Students sometimes think that we're trying to isolate structure in order to devalue or ignore the surface. That's a weird idea. Nobody does that. The goal is to keep structure and surface in our ears simultaneously. That's what I mean by multidimensional hearing. So let's dive in with another example. This is the opening of the slow movement from Mozart's G minor string quartet, a, a fantastic piece, by the way. Here we're in E flat. So I'm going to play it twice, and I want you to notice what the musical surface is like, how does the melody move, how often do the chords change, but I also want you to listen for deeper processes, broader harmonic motions, long-range melodic connections. Here it is again. Before we see how you did, let's analyze the actual chords that Mozart used. This is one of these very common phrases that alternates tonic and dominant almost the whole time and only goes to a predominant to set up the cadence. The bass line starts on tonic and gradually zigzags its way upward. Harmonically, we start on tonic, we move through 5-4-3 up to 1-6, then backtrack to 5-4-3, up through 1-6 to 5-4-2, back to 1-6, then leap into 5-6-5, resolve that, and then move on to the cadence, predominant 1-6-4 and 5 for a half cadence. So on the surface, there are 12 chords here. 
But if you're like me, you can also listen through the surface to hear five harmonic areas, and I'll color code these. A half bar of tonic, a half bar of dominant, one and a half beats of tonic, and then predominant and dominant. Now, why do I hear it this way? Once again, it's a question of rhythm and duration. Notice that each of the first three functional areas I've marked here, tonic, dominant, and tonic, has three chords in it. And within each box here, the first and last chords match the function of the box as a whole. So in the first and third boxes, you have tonics surrounding a dominant, and the middle box has two dominants surrounding a tonic. And for me, the middle chord in each box, the one that mismatches the function of the box, merely serves a kind of connecting role. So 5-4-3 in the first box links two tonics without disrupting the kind of tonic force field that lasts throughout those two beats. To me, that 5-4-3 has a much weaker dominant function than the 5-4-3 that falls on the next strong beat just afterward. And thanks to the strength of that chord, it's the tonic's turn to play a functionally weak connecting role. Just like the 5-6-5 that connects the next two tonics. So let's talk about melody now. For me, the situation here is similar to the last example. I hear a stepwise melodic skeleton built up from notes that line up with the onset of each new functional area. We can see this more easily if we take all the other chords out. Now it's easy to see how a single stepwise line holds the melody together, rising from scale degree 3 up to 5, and then back down to 2. And the bass line is even simpler. It rises from tonic to the cadential dominant. Together they sound like this. So as we listen again, try to focus your hearing on the deeper harmonic and melodic motions I've teased out here. There's one more really crucial concept to get down here, and it's one where melody and harmony directly intersect. This is the concept of contrapuntal chords. Let me explain what this means. So far, we've established that for many listeners, including me, not all chords are created equally. Some have a structural role, and others serve to embellish them. Well, analysts like to classify these embellishing chords based on the melodic behavior of their bass notes. And when they do this, they borrow terms from the language of counterpoint. You know how we have passing and neighbor tones, right? Well, now we have passing and neighbor chords as well. Let's go back to the quintet passage to see some of these. Remember that in my hearing, maybe yours as well, the first half bar of the phrase had a deep level tonic function, and that this chord served to connect those two harmonies without exerting a very strong dominant function of its own. Well, look at the bass line here. The bass note of 5-4-3 literally connects the bass notes of 1 and 1-6, much like a melodic passing tone would connect two chord tones. So analysts would call that middle chord a passing chord. And of course, it doesn't hurt that there's a passing motion in the upper voices as well. The same thing happens in the next bar. The 1-6 that connects the surrounding dominants would also be called a passing chord because it's more connecting material than a real tonic, and its bass moves by step between two more structural notes, just like a passing tone. But what about the next tonic area? The bass line here is different. It starts on scale degree 3, but then leaps up into scale degree 7, which resolves to tonic. We decided that the 5-6-5 chord here plays a supporting role, but it can't be a passing chord because of the bass line. Indeed, the bass note here is more like an appoggiatura than a passing chord, so analysts would tend to call this kind of embellishing chord an incomplete neighbor harmony. Remember that incomplete neighbor is just another word for appoggiatura. For a regular neighbor chord, we have to go back to the concerto movement that we started with. I'm sure you remember that while the passage alternates ones and fives throughout, rhythm creates a tonic emphasis for four bars, a dominant emphasis for four bars, and back to tonic. 
And if we look at the first two bars of the dominant area, it's easy to see that the root position tonic chord there is a neighbor chord. The structural bass note, scale degree 7, pops up briefly to scale degree 1, and then lands back where it started just in time for the next strong beat. The tonic chord is rhythmically weak, it plays a supporting role, and its bass note is part of this away and back again motion that we associate with neighbor notes. We also see a neighbor chord in the first system. And the same two chords are involved, but now the roles are reversed. Now tonic is on the strong beats, and 5-6 is the connecting material. So while we just saw tonic acting as an upper neighbor, embellishing 5-6, now 5-6 is a lower neighbor, embellishing the strong beat tonics. This gives us a good reminder that the relationship just isn't in the chords themselves, it's all about context. When tonic is the stronger chord, 5-6 is the embellishment, and vice versa. Now, one of the reasons I like this idea of passing and neighbor chords is that they help us think about chord progressions in terms of melodic motion and musical line. It lets us rationalize harmony in terms of melody. But I'd like to take the idea a little bit farther than most textbooks do. For theory textbooks today, it seems like we can only call something a passing or neighbor chord based on what the bottom voice does. But where does that leave us with the rest of the passage? Look at the first three bars of the tonic area here. The bass line jumps up and down by fourth. So the textbooks imply that those supporting five chords can't be passing or neighbor chords. So what are they? Well, it seems to me the answer is staring us in the face. They are neighbor chords, but the neighbor motion that we care about is not in the bass, it's in the top voice. Tonic keeps bumping up to two and back again. That's a neighbor note, and it helps us explain those five chords in terms of linear motion and counterpoint, which was like the whole purpose of this exercise, right? So I'm making up a new term right here, right now, upper voice neighbor chord. Take that, music theory. Anyway, I want to close by asking a question you might have posed to yourself a long time ago. Why do we care about any of this? Well, one reason might be that we're just interested in musical perception and experience. For many of us, these metaphors of surface and depth make a lot of intuitive sense, and they can help us reflect on what we hear and why. But that's kind of abstract. So how about something more practical? This kind of structural listening can help us notice long-range melodic connections, which can be hugely helpful when it comes to accurate hearing and, let's just say it, in the kinds of dictation activities that teachers use to help build musical skills. Case in point, let's go back to the Mozart quintet. Suppose you're trying to notate this melody in a dictation exercise. And let's imagine that you're like a lot of students and that you feel way more confident recognizing steps than leaps. So the melody starts on scale degree three and you hear it step down to tonic. That's easy. But then there's a leap up to wait, what note is that? Uh-oh, because you hear it step down twice after the leap, but those notes will be wrong if you don't get the leap right. And while you're worrying about that, Mozart has the audacity to leap again, so you have no idea where you are, and then it steps up and leaps immediately down, and so on and so on. And if you're going note by note, every single leap is a chance for things to go completely off the rails. But Imagine what the same task is like for the person who listens to deeper structures and connections. They're not going to get mired in note-to-note -note details. They're going to zoom out a bit, and the first thing they'll notice will be that stepwise skeleton holding the line together. And it just so happens that those anchor points are the very notes that our other student couldn't hear because on the surface, we leap into them. But under the surface, they're all connected by step. Another cool thing about this kind of structural hearing is that it brings out family resemblances in pieces that aren't obviously connected in any way. Take one last look at the framework we heard in the quintet passage. On the deepest level, the bass rises by step and the top voice follows it in parallel tenths before turning back down again. That's actually a pretty common framework and it gets reused all the time. Check out the opening of Beethoven's second-to-last piano sonata. The bass line zigs and zags a lot, but the deeper structure is just a rising stepwise line with the same notes and functions as the Mozart quintet. 
tonic over scale degree one, dominant over scale degree two, tonic over scale degree three, predominant over four, and dominant over five. And the top voice skeleton is also really similar to the Mozart. We start by rising by step from scale degree three, making those parallel tenths with the bass, and it only really differs in that the parallel tenths go one step further before landing on an octave above scale degree five. Have a listen. Now that you know what to listen for, see if you can home in on that same framework in this Song Without Words by Mendelssohn. Now, this one's a little more complicated, but I bet you notice that the bass line starts by rising from scale degree one through two and three, and then ends after a little detour on four to five. This one's different from the Mozart and the Beethoven in that it ends on tonic, okay? And because of a little functional cycle that's inserted before the cadence with a rising six, seven, one bass line. And the melody in this one's a bit complicated too, but you can't miss that it starts out, big surprise, with those same parallel tenths we've taught ourselves to hear. So it might be a more distant cousin of that Mozart quintet passage, but we can still hear that family resemblance. Let's listen again. So let's wrap up with a quick summary. Number one, we learned that rhythm and meter can create a sense of hierarchy where some notes and chords feel like they just carry more weight than others. And this can give us the sense that a single passage can have different levels of harmonic and melodic activity, some of which are deeper and others more superficial. Number two, supporting and connecting chords can be explained melodically as so-called passing and neighbor chords. Third and finally, Listening through the surface for these deeper structures can make us better and more accurate listeners while revealing hidden similarities between pieces. Now, I should point out that hierarchy in music is a huge topic, and we've only just scratched the surface here. But we're going to keep it in mind as we move forward, including in the very next video, where we're going to ask whether certain things that look and sound like chords aren't really chords at all. And I'll see you then.